I'll have the uh, great pleasure uh, to announce another uh, of my uh, directors. Of course, Joe uh, Cassidy is not here as a director of Explore Mars. In this panel, he is presenting <coughs> himself as um, a rocket boy, because that's what he is for us. And I think uh, you agree that we are working, what he does for Ararat uh, Drocodine uh, does um, give him the uh, right to call himself Rocket Joe. Um, the other uh, panel as well is going to be, um, of course, interesting people to tell us how to do the affording the affordable exploration of Mars, because we all know that if we go to Mars, we have to do it within a budget. Um, even if we would be able to raise money privately also for this, I think that's not going to cut it. We have to you know, work within the budget. That, I think, is the other message of the Affording Mars workshop. Um, OK, Joe, where are you? Okay, we'll wait a second. Anyone like to comment on the Affording Mars workshop who was there? Because I know many of you in the audience uh, were there. Okay. Gives me time to put their uh, name tags. Uh, gathered a group of about 60 uh, folks from across industry, government, academia, um, and our purpose was to look at this, this uh, whole challenge of going to Mars, putting humans on Mars in the 2030s, but from the standpoint of affordability. And uh, the graphic that's now on the screen behind me is an outcome of that workshop. And what we're going to try to do here this morning on this panel, we've gathered a rather august group of folks here, uh, which you know pretty much also represent government, industry, and academia. Um, and uh, as you can see uh, from the graphic, there are a few phases that we see. It's going to be an incremental process to uh, get us to Mars in, by 2030. Um, we recognize that. That starts with the space station, as Tabor did discuss earlier. Uh, so we have Sam here on the panel with us, and he's going to lead off with some discussions about things that uh, we can use the space station for, and we are using the space station for already, to prepare us for this journey. Uh, and then as we move into phase two, you can see uh, the rows across there. We have a number of different things. Some are technology demonstrations that we need to do to evolve our capabilities. Some are potential missions that we could do, which uh, challenge us, as Tabor just discussed. And you'll see one of those is a Mars flyby up there on the graphic. Um, there's also an asteroid redirect mission. Um, they're all the things that are being discussed in the news right now uh, and on the blogosphere. Uh, so, we're going to tell you about some of those today, and uh, so that's what we've assembled this panel to do, and really we're gonna focus on that phase one, phase two transitional uh, opportunity in the next 10 years. What are these things that we need to be doing to prepare to go on to Mars? So with that, I'm gonna just introduce Sam and have him give his remarks, and then we'll go in order around the panel here. Uh, so Sam is director for the ISS at NASA headquarters within the Human Exploration and Operations Directorate. 
He's worked in human spaceflight for over 25 years. He's also held contractor and civil servant positions that span a variety of programs, from the Space Shuttle to the Sophia Airborne Telescope. Sam? All right, thanks. Uh, should I go up there? Is that all right? Uh, if you'd like. Yeah, I'd I like to see my slides a little okay. bit better. OK. There is a monitor right here also. Yep. So I want to talk a little bit to uh, get us kicked off about what we're doing on Space Station and how the station fits in a, in a larger context of affordability. And okay. So at the beginning of this year, um, Dr. Holdren from OSTP and uh, Charlie Bolden from NASA announced that, that we were extending the life of Space Station to at least 2024. So in all the things that we're doing on Station, we've got uh, another 10 years at least to uh, accomplish those things. And those things include a wide variety of things. It's not just trying to get us to Mars, even though that's one of our primary objectives. But on station, we have a large policy body that's, uh, that's our ob objective, from returning benefits to people on Earth through research and medical uh, and, and pharmaceutical activities, uh, enabling a commercial-driven market in low Earth orbit, not only in transportation, as you're well aware of, and crew and cargo, but also in research and application in space. Uh, what we're here today to talk about, enabling long duration space flight beyond LEO. Uh, and, and finally, the uh, basis for further cooperation uh, in international partners for exploration. All right, uh, you've seen this chart several times before. Uh, if you, what's important for us on space station, as far as get, getting us beyond low Earth orbit and on to Mars in long duration, is this time, whoa, that one's supposed to have, is this time period down here. On station, we have missions that are six to 12 months long. We're gonna fly our first uh, long duration crew uh, in 2015. Uh, and if you look all the way to Mars, it's you know two to, th two to three years uh, time period for, for humans on a round trip to Mars. That's a huge gap. Uh, Tabor talked a little bit about the, the challenges a little while ago. Uh, those challenges have never been overcome before, and that's what we're trying to overcome in Space Station. Uh, you look at the proving ground, I'll talk a little bit about, about this later, is that all the things we're doing on Station has to lead to the next thing. Uh, in order to get to Mars, to be able to test and prove that all the systems work and breaking the bonds of Earth, uh, that we have today on space station, uh, that we can actually accomplish those things. Today, if you will, we're basically just car camping in space. Uh, we have anywhere from 14 to 15 flights to space station every year, including crew and cargo. Uh, we ba basically have a very long umbilical to the Earth. When you're going to Mars, we have none of that. We have no resupply. Everything you need, you have to take with you. Your Euclid system has to work or you're dead. On station, if something ter it's a bad day on station, we just come home in a couple of hours. There's no really coming home uh, uh, for several months going to Mars. And you see a little question mark right here. So all the things we're trying to do on station, I'll get to that in a second, has to lead to something, the next step uh, in, in, in our proving ground uh, to prove that we can actually go, go to Mars. Uh, so what are we doing on space station? Uh, we're going to validate our um, crew health and performance on board and the countermeasures that go along with that. And then once we validate that, we need to take that beyond low Earth orbit and, and prove that we can uh, mitigate all those things in actual uh, a more simulated environment. Uh, then to ne demonstrate the life support system that will actually take us to Mars. Uh, that is a challenge all by itself. Uh, we'd like to demonstrate that system maybe one to two years in an operational state on station. Um, also learning how to break the bonds of the Earth from logistics, that I talked about previously, uh, uh, crew transportations four times a year, uh, our crew health monitoring, all our samples for crew health come down the ground, blood, urine, air, water, all that comes down to the ground for, for monitoring. On the way to Mars, we don't have that luxury to bring all this stuff back. Uh, and then, of course, to demonstrate all the other technologies, um, for instance, uh, four junction solar arrays, what we're doing with rendezvous sensors, and things like docking system. Uh, th this, you're not meant to read this. Uh, this is the human uh, health and performance uh, burn down plan. 21 of the risks that are down this line require station to mitigate. So 
If you look on this chart, uh, they're not mitigated till sometime in the mid-2025, uh, mid-2020s time frame. That means right now with station ending in 2024 time frame, there's some re residual risk that's left over. There will always be residual risk. This is not a, a zero risk to go to Mars, for, from, especially from a human standpoint. From a technology standpoint, uh, all the things in green here, the station is primed to mitigate those risks or mitigate those gaps. From environmental control and life support, which you might expect, to EVA, uh, to fire safety, to COM, for like things like laser COM. Um, of course, the uh, operational aspects, and you hear some of that tomorrow in the panel that I'm hosting tomorrow. Uh, and of course, the human health and performance areas, uh, habitation and lightweight structures. Uh, the ones in white, stations not really fitted well to, to support those activities. And the ones in yellow, uh, we have some uh, activities proposed to actually close the gaps in those areas. Again, the next couple of slides are just a, a, a compilation of all the technology and system demonstrations that we're performing on stations. So you can see we're doing a lot in all, in all those areas. Uh, and we're continuing to re keep refining those plans to, to continue to uh, close those gaps and get to the point where we're ready to take the next steps beyond lower <coughs> orbit. Uh, that continues, and that's all I got. Are we going to take questions afterwards? Yes. Is that how we're yeah. going to do it? All right. Thank that's you. all I got. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Okay, so next up we have Lou Friedman. And Lou, you're welcome to just uh, speak from here. Lou started his career at Avco Space Systems before moving to JPL. And while there, he was also uh, at, at a time served as an AIAA Congressional Fellow on the staff of the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. So he had a lot of experience in industry, working in the government, and also up here in the 17-mile uh, wide logic free zone. Uh, so in 1980, he left JPL and founded the Planetary Society with a couple of other folks that we've all heard of, Carl Sagan and Bruce Murray. Currently, he's the co-lead for the Keck Institute for Space Studies Asteroid Retrieval Study that's been going on out at Caltech, and you're going to tell us a little bit about the ARM, I think. Well, thank you, and uh, glad to be here. Good morning. Uh, I'm glad they applauded for you, Sam, because we can't see the audience we at all. We can't see them at all. <laughs> there were bright lights, and you're totally dark, but, but I assume there are people there are out people there. There are people out there. Okay, that's great. Um, we hope. And as uh, indicated, I... Uh, I do have, I'm a Mars guy, I, I'm past, present, and future. Actually, at JPL, I was the head of the Mars, post-Viking Mars program for a while, and, uh, and in all my years at the Planetary Society, I've been a, an advocate uh, for Mars exploration. I don't want any confusion about that, because I'm going to talk about the asteroid redirect mission. I'm very excited and very interested and very positive about it for uh, a number of reasons. Um, First of all, and perhaps the most importantly, uh, it gives our astronauts a meaningful and uh, valuable destination very soon, a mission they can do uh, much sooner than anything else that's uh, either on the books or in our capabilities. Uh, and uh, if we delay it or if we don't do it, uh, I think it'll be at least five years, perhaps a decade, and uh, I would argue even perhaps uh, forever uh, that we will have humans going uh, be, uh, deeper into space. Um, uh, I'm also interested in it because it puts, the, uh, puts us on what the Augustine Committee termed a flexible path into the solar system. Uh, and that's a path that, of course, takes us toward Mars, uh, as we've heard many times uh, here at this conference. Um, interested in it because it provides a further and longer, deeper space accomplishment, uh, deeper in space than anyone else can do, deeper in space than we've ever been. Even now, uh, uh, even as the first step, that will, that will be accomplished. It provides a, a unique accomplishment. This is something only uh, America can do. Uh, it, it is a sign of leadership, and yet it admits to a great uh, international program. Uh, to me, it answers that question about those who worry about, gee, can't we do over what we did uh, 40 years ago? No, we're going to do something deeper, further. It's a, it's a, a new accomplishment. And if we're going out into the so, st taking steps beyond the moon and into the solar system in the decade of the 2020s, uh, we will welcome those who uh, uh, 
both in the commercial world, in the private world, and uh, internationals who might be doing uh, other steps that we did before. Uh, I'm excited about it because it's robotic and human. Uh, one of the pet peeves I've had at, about NASA is the use of the word exploration as if it was only human exploration. It's, of course, deeply robotic exploration, and the great missions to the planets uh, have emphasized that. This harnesses both the uh, uh, capabilities of the robotic program and the human program working together, which is the only way we're going to uh, make m meaningful new accomplishments uh, for humans in space exploration. It's scientific. Uh, again, not since Apollo will we have had the ability to uh, have astronauts working on a, on a celestial object at a place doing scientific experiments, learning the unknown. We don't even know the basic composition of uh, what we'll be landing on, and maybe even not its structure. Rubble pile to solid rock uh, are all the possibilities. Uh, we're going to hopefully take all the steps to mitigate the risks of the astronauts, but just like in the lunar mission when they worried about the unknowns, uh, this will be very exciting and uh, give a lot of new experiences for uh, advancing human space exploration. Uh, I'm interested in this because it advances technology. The solar electric propulsion is an enabling technology for many deep space applications. The, uh, we heard about the rendezvous and docking, the capture, uh, the operations on the astronauts, and then in my own field of astrodynamics, a whole lot of new things are coming up about heliocentric destinations on the path to Mars, uh, Lagrange points, uh, resonant orbits with Earth that allow for uh, one month, three months, six months, one year missions on the steps to Mars. Um, and then uh, I, I bring another aspect of uh, makes this interesting is it's important. It's important we learn about asteroids. Uh, these are uh, both the, from the commercial point of view about those who think we'll utilize them in the future or the planetary defense point of view. We have a whole range of questions. Uh, this extends both our knowledge about them and uh, also uh, our experience with them and adds to the scientific understanding and already that's beginning just because of the observation program that, that this is stimulated into uh, in near-Earth asteroids. Most of all, this puts us, as I said at the very beginning, on a path that goes deeper, further, longer into the solar system, beginning the sets of accomplishments that we need to make, setting records every step we take out into the solar system. Um, it's very difficult, so it's challenging, it's very exciting. It will involve the public. Uh, when we see uh, both the robotic capture, which I hope we do see live, and the astronauts working on the asteroid, these will be great engaging activities. It will sustain, and come back to that word of the Augustine Committee, the program needs to be sustainable. So it has to have meaningful small steps that are engaging to the public along the way. If I bring anything to this discussion at all uh, that others don't, I mean, I have some technical knowledge, but everybody has technical knowledge and answers. It's a sense of the public experience. As head of the Planetary Society for 30 years, deeply involved in the question of public support and how to tie that to uh, the political support. They're often, they're very different things. And I think this is the bridge. Uh, this will be engaging while it's happening, and yet it's on the path for the long range. For the, all of those reasons uh, is why I think we've developed the asteroid redirect mission. Thank you, Lou. So uh, next up, we have Josh Hopkins. And uh, I was going to say uh, he really doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he's kind of one of the go-to guys when you're talking about architectures for things and how to get out toward uh, Mars and other destinations beyond low Earth orbit. But I'll read you what Josh told me. He said he's actually a technical advisor on the recent science fiction movie, The Europa Report. So we'll all be looking for that soon, I guess, in theaters. Uh, but in his day job, he's the space exploration architect at Lockheed Martin, where he leads a team of engineers responsible for figuring out how to send astronauts to the moon, libration points, asteroids, and the moons of Mars. I'll turn it over to you, Josh. Thanks very much. He threatened to make up an introduction if I didn't give him one, so I figured it was better than uh, what he might come up with. So I want to talk a little bit about what some of the options are for the missions that we could do in the early exploration phase in the next decade on the way to Mars. 
And one of the ways to think about this is to look at what's currently on the agenda. So if you look at this chart here, I apologize for the size of the screen. This is laid out in time and in distance. And there are three big gaps that we need to address. The first and most obvious is that we have a big gap in time between the ISS missions in the lower left there and the Mars mission, which, or Mars orbit mission that President Obama suggested, which will probably happen in the mid-2030s because that is when the 15-year orbital mechanics cycle will be at its best and will probably coincide with when the 11-year solar activity cycle will be at its best for protection from radiation. So that, that might be 2033 instead of 2035 for a launch date, but it's probably not happening much sooner than that. What we have in the plans on the books right now is to operate ISS with six month missions and one or two one year stays and to do a few very short um, missions to sort of the edge of deep space just beyond the moon. The EM-1, EM-2 test flights and then the asteroid retrieval mission which based on when we can bring back an asteroid will probably be something like 2024 or 2025. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what is going to fill the gap between <laughs> the early 2020s and the 2033 or 2035 Mars mission. The second thing we need to think about is what's going to fill the duration gap. A Mars mission is likely to be something like two and a half years long. We need to practice and build up incrementally towards that duration of mission. And the, the things we have on the books right now are relatively short missions. So we need to add some missions that keep crew in deep space for much longer and learn about things like regenerative life support that's more reliable and, and closes the loop better than ISS does, or learn about the um, social dynamics of being locked in a, in a small habitat for long periods of time. The other thing we need to deal with is the gap in distance. Mars is a thousand times farther away than the moon is, and that has all sorts of op operating implications, the most obvious of which is the speed of light problem. If you say, Houston, we have a problem, it could take you an hour to get an answer. That's a whole different way of operating a spacecraft. The astronauts and their systems need to be much more independent from Earth, as has been talked about. It also means that you can't come home anytime soon in an abort. We need to not only design the systems, but we need to figure out how we operate and manage programs where that level of risk is involved. So I want to walk you through a couple of examples of missions that could incrementally add those capabilities. The other thing I would say, there's a dimension that doesn't fit on this chart, which is the technologies and capabilities we need to add. And I group those in my head into two different categories. One category is the things that are unique to Mars, such as landing, you know, entering the Mars atmosphere and landing in Mars gravity, or dealing with the planetary protection issues of Mars. The other category is things that involve just getting to any distant deep space destination on a long trip. So that's advanced propulsion, that's living with the radiation from cosmic rays, that's dealing with the effects of microgravity. Those issues we can prove out going to other destinations first. So here's an example of an early mission we could do. This is Orion capturing a sample of the far side of the moon that's been brought up to a distant retrograde orbit or an L2 halo orbit by a small robotic sample vehicle. The attraction of this is that if you don't have to take an Earth return capsule all the way down to the moon to bring your robotic sample back up, you can increase the mass of sample by something like a factor of 10. This is a mission we can do with no new technology. It's a very straightforward mission. The launch windows allow you to launch any day of the week that you like. So this is a mission that could be done relatively soon. And it's something like a three or four week uh, mission duration. The next step would be to spend a little bit longer in the, sort of the edge of deep space at these orbits like the distant retrograde orbit or L2. And the cheapest, simplest, soonest way to do that would be to repurpose something like an ISS logistics vehicle. You can't just launch it out. You need to modify it a little bit, but not as much as you might think. This could offer you the ability to have astronauts stay out at L2 for a month or so. It's not a very long-term extensible solution, but it does give you one way to get some practice early. If instead you want a longer term solution, you need room for exercise gear and life support, and you need a little bit more living space. So here's a solution that an international industry consortium has sort of come up with. This is a Russian ISS module as the main element on the top. You see an Orion towards the foreground. In the back is a logistics vehicle 
with a Canadian arm that's, that's um, birthing it. This could be a US logistics vehicle, it could be a Japanese logistics vehicle, it could be a European logistics vehicle. All of these countries have looked at the options for this and they all believe it is within their technical capabilities and maybe even within their fiscal budgets. The primary feature of an outpost like this would be to teleoperate assets on the lunar far side to address science questions like radio astronomy in the ultra quiet zone on the far side or planetary science and lunar geology. So you see in the sort of deliberately dark there in the bottom right, a Canadian rover exploring a dark lunar crater. Sorry, that's all uh, garbled up. But if you were to mentally rearrange all the puzzle tiles there, <laughs> what you would see is after the ARM mission, which will bring a, a tiny asteroid back to the lunar vicinity, we can go out to asteroids in their natural habitat, if you will, and visit an asteroid that is something like a six month trip. This is bigger than the, you know, the, the asteroids that would fit in this room that are the targets for ARM. Think of this as something more like the size of this building or perhaps the size of the Capitol building. These are interesting destinations in their own right. They are potential asteroid resources in space as Lou has, has mentioned. They're also great practice stepping stones to Mars because you can do a six month mission or a 12 month mission. And now we're really getting out into deep space. We think the final step before landing on Mars could be to send astronauts to the moons of Mars. My preferred moon is Deimos. I know other people prefer Phobos. We can have a debate about it later. Yeah. Um, and we will. And we will. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't really make that big a difference. Um, so this is an interesting place both to prove that you can get all the way to Mars before you have perhaps mastered all the techniques to land and live on Mars. But it's also an interesting place to operate robotic assets that are exploring Mars globally instead of just around one landing site. And potentially it's a place to get propellant or other resources that will be useful for Mars. We know surprisingly little about these moons because the people in charge of the Mars program believe they are not Mars and the people in charge of the rest of the solar system believe they're the Mars program's problem. So we have actually not sent exploration missions even robotically to map these moons, one of the first steps could be to figure out whether in fact there are reasonable, reasonable resources to use for missions. And an early objective of course of a mission like this would be to do Mars surface sample return where a robotic vehicle could bring uh, samples back up to the astronauts. So with that I will, uh, oh, so one, one final slide. Here's what that earlier timeline looks like if you fill in some of these missions. So we have increasing duration um, missions to the L2 or DRO vicinity to an outpost to learn how to operate for say six to nine months. And then a few missions to incrementally farther distances to different asteroids. I will point out that the, let's see, do we have a laser pointer? Hang on. <laughs> this one, this is every, every asteroid mission planner's favorite asteroid. 2000 SG344 is one of the easiest to get to but it is also presently the most dangerous asteroid in the next century in terms of the combination of its probability of hitting us and its size. It's not, I don't want to panic anybody, it's not very dangerous, but on the list, it's the, it's the highest risk. And then a sequence of missions to Deimos and Phobos leading eventually to Mars. So with that, I will hand it over. Okay, thank you, to Josh. You. So our, uh, our last speaker today to title together for us is Kent Rominger. Kent is VP of Strategy and Development for the Space Launch Division of ATK. He's a five-time shuttle astronaut, including two flights as a mission commander. And prior to that, he flew F-14 Tomcats for the U.S. Navy. Kent? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thanks, everybody. The, uh, what a fascinating panel. And what I'm going to try to do is tie everything together. And interestingly, the, the title of our panel was Affordability. Right? And that's the difficult one. Uh, and so... I think we have a lot of decisions to be made uh, in the upcoming years, but they have to be made. Folks are asking, folks on the Hill are asking, everybody's saying, well, what is our plan? And we're all assuming we definitely want to be on Mars in the 2030s. So I'm counting that as kind of the, the, the common goal by everybody. And so to make it kind of put it into basic terms today, what do we have? We, we have the space station a great, great asset for us to uh, continue to gather in science and buy down the risks, the many risks of going on a Mars mission because going to Mars is very hard. 
We also have, as Lou pointed out, when we say exploration, we're doing a lot robotically, right, with the rovers on Mars today and the various probes out around our solar system. Uh, it's important to leverage all that information too. We also know today SLS Orion are being developed in uh, Tabor. I was happy to see, you know, he came back and said, hey, the bottom line is when we go to Mars, when you go into deep space, you need a heavy lift capability. That's just kind of the facts of life given the kinds of technologies and chemical propulsion that we have today. So the good news is Orion is flying later this year. SLS is on track to fly in 2017. These are the fundamental building blocks for us putting boot prints on Mars in the 2030s. Uh, the next slide is kind of in line with a lot of what we've seen. Okay, we know what's in development. We know our goal is Mars. How do we do that? How do we get between where we are today and 2030, actually having boot prints on Mars? How do we do that affordably? Which means really that, hey, we will figure out how to get the, the public, and Lou, I think you're exactly right on. The plan that we come up with has to excite the public. It also has to have political support uh, for us to be able to afford it because the fact is it's gonna cost a fair amount of money so I borrowed this slide from NASA. I think the first step we've got to do is take a step back and say, well, what are the requirements? If we're going to be, have boot prints on Mars in 2035, what are the, what's the critical path? What are those requirements that I've got, to, I've got to know and do? And so this shows us, hey, we're using the space station for, to buy down the reliability and life support, understand the life sciences period, what happens to the astronauts. Uh, and then the next step, is start looking at things such as deep space habitats that, that Josh was talking about. Uh, and then lastly, for Mars destination, all the, those critical things you need to know to go onto Mars. Uh, what is kind of becoming more and more obvious to me, and if you look at what we talked about today, to gain the, the kind of uh, risk buy-down, technology buy-down, and, and understanding the true challenges of having people walk around on Mars. Uh, I believe the next step probably is a deep space habitat. Uh, the beauty in a deep space habitat, and deep space could be cis-lunar, but it also fits right into the asteroid redirect mission. Right? That's, that's where you bring the asteroid back within the vicinity, so now astronauts can routinely and routinely, maybe every six months, uh, start working with that asteroid in that vicinity. Also from the deep space habitat, I think we saw Josh showed different things we can do with the moon. Uh, you could use solar electric power to maneuver this deep space habitat maybe back and forth between a, a retrograde orbit and an L2. From an L2, you can do a certain amount of science on the back side of the moon that's pretty critical, very important to a lot of scientists. Uh, so SCP is one thing that hadn't come up in our, our discussion that probably really is one of the technologies we need to take a hard look at because it allows us to particularly transfer hardware, maybe not humans so much uh, because it's a slower ride, uh, and I don't know we don't want to take that amount of time, but for staging hardware and starting getting it on its way to Mars on those long distances, it's a very economical way to do that. Uh, so. You know, in my, in my wrap up here, you probably thought I was going to bring answers. Uh, I think really what I'm doing is generating more questions than answers, but that's, that's really, I think our goal is to figure out how do we affordably get to Mars, which means we've got to have the support from the public, the political support. And the, the other thing that was mentioned that I wanted to bring up was when we talk about ISS derived capabilities, I put international cooperation on there because from what I've observed, NASA has done a phenomenal job the last decade and a half of leading this international endeavor, this partnership that has turned out really, really well uh, between multiple nations across the globe. And I, I believe we need to continue that. I believe the only way going to Mars is truly affordable is using the internationals, and we need to continue on the relationships that we've built on ISS to do that. Also on my chart, you'll notice this orange dot uh, I kind of have as a deep space habitat. 
And I'd love uh, for questions for, for folks. To, if you have any questions, please ask those today. If you have any really hard questions on that, Josh said he wanted all the hard questions. Uh, but the, uh, I think a deep space habitat may be a key that we ought to take a hard look at to really be able to, to gain uh, the kind of knowledge we need, something that's sustainable. We need something to do that's somewhat routine. Otherwise, as humans, we tend not to do it well. There's long gaps in between it. Uh, this also gives us that. And then on to Mars. So that's Great. all I've got. Thank Joe. you. Thank you very much. All right, so I guess uh, just to summarize, I think uh, what I'd like to leave you with, if our panel told you anything, is one, we are thinking about the next 10 years. We are thinking about how to take those first steps and how to take them affordably. And the second thing is uh, we're going to have debates. We're going to have debates about what's the right next mission and things like that. But along the way, we're going to need to develop these capabilities. And what we're trying to do is put in place something that's pretty robust to whatever destinations we choose. Uh, but we'll take those incremental steps that we're going to need to get, be ready to go to Mars in the 2030s. So that's our summary. And I'd welcome any questions. Uh, uh, a few questions. Bob Terry, Mars Society, CAP, or, uh, areas. I'm sort of confused here, and a lot of things are, are missing from these scenarios, which I think ought to be thought through and not rejected. I don't see any capability for having artificial gravity while you travel between the planets, and I think that that hasn't been examined correctly. And I wonder why that's never there. ISS has never had a centrifuge, but ISS could park the Mars gravity biosatellite right outside and learn about the mouse model and fractional gravity. That's something that ought to be in the trajectory here, which isn't very expensive when we're talking affordability. Sure. You could also take the Mars gravity satellite and put it at L1 out there so you could get radiation and gravity at the same time. So some of these things, these precursor measurements seem missing. And so I'm a little disturbed that uh, this looks like affordability, but it, it looks like a very uh, meek approach. Uh, there, there's, I think there's room for some real uh, creativity here that's still affordable, and it might make things better. So I'm curious about why you know, fractional gravity is not being addressed. Right, right, and another question is I'm, I'm, I'm curious why the emphasis on solar electric propulsion. Solar electric propulsion is fine for deep space missions, long duration, and where you're mainly looking for gas mileage dominantly. It's clear that if you have nuclear thermal propulsion, you can throw more weight to Mars uh, for you know, the cost invested. Okay. Why is nuclear thermal propulsion a major thread in your notion of affordability for Mars? Your, your Block 1B guy can throw a whole lot more if he's got a nuclear thermal upper stage. Okay. Why not put that on the track? Why not insist that be on the track? Can we take, can we take your two questions? I, never okay. mind. Okay, but, Josh, yeah. you want to take the first okay. on the fractional gravity? Sure, so I'll, I'll give my thoughts on this and then somebody else can weigh in sure. if they want to. So, so I agree with your comment about artificial gravity being an interesting um, technology. And one way that one could approach the next 10 years is to say, what are kind of the key big architectural decisions we don't know yet about how we would want to go to Mars and what can we do to answer those questions? I think one example I talked about is figuring out, does it make any sense to use Phobos and Deimos as fuel depots? You could do that robotically or easily. Um, and the other is, do you want to use artificial gravity or not in a Mars transfer vehicle? So we've looked at whether you could do an artificial gravity test flight with Orion. And the assumption is that you want to do that with astronauts and not just with mice or some tiny uh, biological uh, substitute. You, you, could, um, you could learn about the mouse model first. What I was going to say is that we, we have looked at how to do human scale artificial gravity flight tests. And actually, DLR, the German Space Agency, just recently funded a study in Europe looking at the same question. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Bless you. Sorry. <laughs> hey, for the record, that was a real sneeze. <laughs> um, so it is an interesting idea. It, it, 
it starts to get um, complicated to do at full human scale. And I think that's one of the reasons that it often has not been included in the transportation architectures sure. to go to Mars is that it, it ends up solving some problems and creating others. Yeah. Um, but if you wanted to, to do a flight test to figure out that, you could do that. Um, mm -hmm. on, the, on the nuclear thermal versus SEP, I'm sort of agnostic about what the right answer is for Mars, but I think I can tell you why SEP is in the plan today, and that is that everybody else needs solar electric propulsion. So if you stop and think about what's the biggest space organization in the world by dollars per year, does anybody know? Probably Department of Defense. No, it's no. not NASA, it's not the Department of Defense, yeah, it's Direct TV. Direct, Direct TV, TV yeah. is a $28 right. billion dollar a year organization. Right. Um, and then Infosat. So, yeah, yeah. yeah and, so and Echo Star is a little smaller yeah, than NASA, Echostar and then you get down to, to yeah. Intelsat and everybody else. Right. The rest of the space industry wants solar electric propulsion Right. Um, to, to do other things in space. And so when NASA um, goes to use SEP, they can either take advantage of those investments or when they invest in advanced solar arrays or advanced thrusters, they can see that feed back into the rest of industry and the rest of industry keeps using those so that there's a technology base. Right. Basically nobody else besides NASA for Mars wants nuclear thermal propulsion. Right. So if NASA decides to use nuclear thermal, they're gonna have to foot the bill to develop it and they're going to have to keep it, keep it going. So right. SCP, in some ways, is a lot easier to. Luke, did you, know. you have something else? On? One thing I've learned in the, uh, by my experience on the asteroid retrieval mission, because I was never an SCP proponent, but I've come to realize SCP, even though it's not going to be used on the human mission to Mars, is going to reduce the risk of the human mission to Mars because of enabling all of that. Uh, I think the crazy word they use is pre-deployment of. Exactly. But basically building up a, uh, a capabilities for supplying the uh, human mission in such a way that the total mi uh, human mission risk will be uh, greatly mitigated. Right. And, and I could just add to that, Bob, when we looked at it, and I'm coming from Aerojet Rocketdyne, so if you want to talk about nuclear thermal, Aerojet did NERVA. <laughs> Rocketdyne did the only nuclear propulsion that's ever flown uh, on the SNAP flight. Uh, we know nuclear. And when we looked at it for NASA, our conclusion was something like 85% um, of what we want to take out to Mars doesn't care how fast it gets there. And if we pre-deploy, as Lou said, we can drop the IM LEO by something like 60%. IM LEO translates exactly to dollars. That's what we're talking about is we're talking about affordability and for all the other reasons that Josh yeah. brought in. That's, that's what brought it into I, the flight. I'd also like to add that there's no perfect way to get to Mars. Yeah. The perfect way is the way that we actually do it. Um, the station we have is not the perfect space station. Right. But it, it's the perfect station because it's the one we have. And how many iterations? And how many iterations it, 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 it took to get there? It because there. Basically, we're, we're trying to solve a risk slash gap problem here. The, yeah. the reason why the centrifuge hasn't been a primary driver is that it's not reducing the, the risk substantially to getting humans to Mars on the type of missions we're talking about. So uh, again, with solar electric propulsion, uh, that wasn't originally thought about. The, the way we thought about missions before was in the Apollo model. Right. Have everything all, all up in one you know, big go and go. Well, that, that type of, of mission uh, is not practical in the environment we live in today. We're not gonna get a national imperative to go to Mars uh, you know, in two years. It's just not gonna happen. It's more long term. It's more. Uh, we have to get the community together to agree upon that way. And there's no one way to do it. And that's the hard part that we have, is to bring the community together to agree on what does that missions look like and how do we close those gaps. Hey, and one, one last okay. comment is, oh, Bob, sorry, hey, those, those are second. great questions. And uh, I don't think we've decided how we're really going. And what I was thrown out there were kind of more suggestions, but I would love if, if nuclear thermal could be developed affordably because faster right. is always better in, in yeah. my book. Well, and, and, so I, and I would add too, Kent, that I'm not saying it's not going to be, I'm just saying, you know, for the initial perhaps mission in the 2030s, it may be something that we choose not to develop immediately, but we certainly saw the benefit of it for the long term. And remembering what we said yesterday and we heard for the first time NASA starting to say, we're not talking about a, you know, go plant a flag and put some boot prints on Mars and come home and never go again. 
we're talking about going and continuing to go. So that'll, that'll come into play later on. I'm sorry, Bob, can I, can I get to our second question? question? And we'll talk offline. Yeah. Yeah. Un unfortunately, the 15% uh, of the missions that do care about how long it takes to get to Mars are the ones with the people on them, which is why we're here. Uh, and in light of referring to that as, a, as an opening comment, uh, I would call the mission profiles that you're talking about here ambitious convention. Now, let's think about a little something a little more unconventional. Uh, one of the central driving factors is that if, if we're going to go, you expect it to take a long time, multi-year missions. Now, Dr. Chang Diaz, with his Vasimir concept, has said basically he can get us to Mars in a month and a half. 38 has, days. Have they looked at that in detail? Yes. Yes. Okay, and? Yes. Will work. Well, okay, so I'll, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the short answer. Power is the driver. Absolutely. Okay. Until we have a large nuclear power source mm -hmm. that can provide multi-hundred kilowatts or megawatts of power. Megawatts. Megawatts, what? really, for Hundreds a full-up Vasimir system. You're not going to get there. My background in and all the work that I've done in my career has taught me that you can't get ahead of your power source. And so that, that would be my short answer to you. And again, I'm not saying that eventually we won't go there. And, and we'd all love to be able to do it much faster. But again, we're talking about the next 10 years, taking those first steps. We want to fly to Mars in 2030. If we, and, if, and I want to come back to something Sam said, there's never a perfect way, right? Mm -hmm. If we wait for the perfect thing to be developed, and that power source has been a long time in coming. I've been through three separate programs in my career where I was relying on a nuclear power source that didn't come to pass and got canceled. The most recent being the JIMO mission, Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter. I want to take the first baby step and fly something that I can get there in 2030 and then evolve to those other capabilities. That's, that's my personal answer. And the power source to get to Mars in 38 days is on the order of a thousand times bigger, bigger. than the reactor that you were. Right. And certainly not something we can do with solar. It's 100 megawatts. Yeah. Lou. Yeah. Uh, I think what I've heard over today I'm hearing in the questions is about lots of ideas about how to do Mars right. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I have my ideas, and all of us do, and, and to me the beauty of the flexible path is, is that those will be figured out as, along as we go. Along. But we've got to get started. But we got it. that's <laughs> the gotta point. We've got to get started. And my strategy is very tactical. In the next budget cycle, maybe the current budget cycle, there's only a couple of issues that relate to anything we're talking about today. We're not having a nuclear thermal uh, issue in front of the Congress. We should, maybe, but we're not. The fact is that the two things on the budget that we have to get behind as a community, you can disagree about all the other infrastructure ways to get there, but the two things we have to get behind is the Mars program that's landing on Mars, the robotic program, the 2020 issue, keeping it in the program, and the asteroid retrieval mission is the first step for astronauts to take beyond the moon. We don't get those two things done, and all of these debates will be just, we'll be back here in 10 years debating. That's right. And I think that one of the things, I mean, this panel is specifically sort of the, the intermediate steps, and the next panel is really about actually going to Mars. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me going through the exercise that I showed you is when we, for example, the chart that shows the international industry concept of an L2 outpost, that did not start out as an exercise to design an L2 outpost. It started out with the question, what should we do next? And in, it's hard enough getting this audience that all wants to go to Mars to agree on what we're trying to do next. It's even harder if you're talking to people who don't agree that Mars is the objective, right? Some people want to go to the moon, some people want to do asteroids, some people have other objectives. But one of the things that this community generally agrees on and that other communities can agree on is that having some kind of habitat in the vicinity of the moon is a good next step yeah for all of those other objectives. So whether, for example, a lot of other countries don't agree with NASA that asteroids should be the next focus, but we can agree that even if you want to go to the moon or an asteroid or Mars, having an outpost is a useful step towards all of those different paths. And we can figure out the propulsion trade later. Next question. What's the magical solution to long-term uh, budgetary commitment, both on the Hill 
budget cutbacks, uh, everything that we're experiencing now, how do we stay on course to make this happen? And especially with administration changes as yeah. well. Got a lot of experience for that. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think it keep it interesting. I think the magic well, bullet is the space program is, nobody thinks the space program's bad. It doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of the environmental and medical controversies about it. They just don't think it's important. And they don't know where it fits in. The space program's interesting and seem to be making progress. Toward, uh, then I think uh, it, that's the law. You're not going to get some magical commitment to Mars over a 30-year multi-Congress, multi-administration activity, multi-international partners. But on the other hand, look, the space station has gone ahead right. mm -hmm. through the collapse of countries, through changing international Wars. relations, through changing administrations, <laughs> through changing purposes, and an activity that goes on. If it's interesting and making progress, and that's why, again, I come back to this notion that we got to get up there and flying and doing these missions, setting distance records, setting speed records, every, just like we did in the airplane right. days, and, and going further and farther. And that gets back to something Josh showed, which is we need a regular cadence of missions. You need something happening. I always refer back to Apollo, because I grew up in the Apollo days. Um, everybody talks about Apollo. Nobody talks about Mercury and Gemini. Mercury and Gemini were those incremental step missions that we had to do to be ready to go to the moon. And that's what we need now for Mars. Um, and we just got to make that case to people and show them that, that this HAB is something we need to do. Yeah. The asteroid mission is and something we need to do. And having the community, the people in this room, uh, see that and have consensus about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, my question is sort of along the lines of what you just mentioned about how we need to get people to come to consensus that no matter what we do, we just need to start doing something in order to take those incremental steps to Mars. Uh, how are we going to go about doing that? Is just, bleh, sorry, is that just a matter of communicating the ideas to people, or is it going to be a bit more of an involved process? I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that. Sure. I, I, it's multifaceted, right? So um, we, uh, within NASA, we do it within our budget cycle and with policy directives uh, between the, the White House and working with Congress and authorization and appropriations. But that's only if you build the tip of the spear. Uh, having an agreement uh, and consensus in the community is you know, through communication. And that communication can take multiple forms, workshops or conferences right. like this, uh, uh, out other public events that are private events uh, outside uh, our community. Uh, what, I'll give you, for instance, what we do with Space Station. Uh, we have something called Destination Station around the country. We go around three or four places around the country and talk to school children and community leaders and the like about what we're doing on station and how that affects their lives, how it affects the country. I think we could do similar things for getting people to Mars, having the same type of community outreach and, and, uh, and engagement that will get people interested. If people know that, that you know, their uncle or cousin or brother is working uh, in their community, in their university, or, or in, with an industry or a government facility, that builds excitement. It builds interest. But it's at the grassroots. So I, I say it's, it's sort of like the consensus pyramid. Lou, you have some to add? Well, I'm going to add to that on the consensus. I said this before, I'll repeat it, because it, it comes down to Congress loves the balkanization of the space movement, if you will, or space interest. They love to broker different constituencies. They organize their hearings about, let's have a hearing on the moon, let's have a hearing about Mars, let's have a hearing about the asteroid observing program, let's have a hearing, because they want all these different constituencies fighting among each other so that they can, you know, parcel out the favors and get, and, and get the votes where they think it is at the immediate moment with usually about a month uh, lead time. We need, again, it comes down to what's the issues right before us now. And I do think that in, if anything can happen, if the industry, Lockheed, Boeing, Aerojet, uh, just to pick on the guys who are here. Uh, <laughs> ATK. Uh, <laughs> SpaceX, I'll pick on them all. 
if the, if the space interest movement, if the scientists would stop carping about their different favorite missions and, and we weren't involved in this discussion and that discussion, <laughs> right. if this community could come out and say we're united behind the existing steps in the budget, yes, we want more, of course. Everybody should argue for 5 to 10 to 15 percent more. Yeah. But we Write should argue that, we're that. Do, we <laughs> need to take these, approve these next steps. We need right. to get the SLS Orion. We need to keep the space station. We need to get that asteroid redirect mission going and then the crew mission to the asteroid so, and the habitat uh, step. Get those things started because those are the budget issues right now. And if they stop fight, infighting about the uh, initial 2015-16 budget cycle right. and keep all our arguments about the 2030 way to do it, I think we'll be in a much yeah. stronger position. And, and I'll just... Uh, jump on that and say, I think Josh and Ken would agree. I think as an industry, we're really starting to do that. I mean, we've we've been getting together now for a couple of years, and the same sort of things that you see Josh talking about, we've been talking about as uh, we have a pretty good consensus now. That's the path we need to start down. And if the companies would do that. I think yeah, the Congress people yeah. would yeah. stop. Right. Would They're stop not hearing different stories, stories from us when we come in. Yeah. So yeah, your, your question is a very good one, and I think I'll, I'll just pile on. And the the fact is industry, NASA, academia, I think we've all realized, hey, there, there is a path that should be very exciting to people, and we're trying to get that pathway developed far enough along, and, and granted, not totally worked out, but at least to get started. And when you start looking at the facets, particularly on the hill, if we always have a, a very high level requirement, so on the Hill, some folks may say, hey, I, I love the asteroid redirect mission. Other folks may say, hey, I don't love it. But if we say, look, this helps us get to Mars. We're trying to put humans on Mars. That's the ultimate goal. Continue to drive to that high level requirement. So even though they may not be hugely supportive of one of the missions that helps us get there, we continue. And so try and, but, but I think the, the key is, uh, folks that represent the different organizations sitting up here, we need to continue to work together uh, as a team. Okay, sure. last comment. I, I think Chris is going to say we're out of time. One comment. There isn't a thing flying in space that I haven't not liked. I didn't <laughs> like Space Station then. I didn't like SLS Orion design then. I don't think the Mars 2020 mission was the one that I wanted proposed. Every good mission, even Voyager, was the grand tour that I worked on, didn't come out the way I wanted it to. But every <laughs> one of these things has been a compromise which is now working and now advancing. And I think we need to remember that, that the, you know, our, all these near-term answers that we might not, you know, we wish we would have redesigned that mission differently, uh, uh, isn't where the action's at. The action is at it, getting it to work and making the next step. Great, thank you, Luke. Thank, please uh, join me in thanking our panel.